All right, so I should be recording now. All right, and so this is the um, and I'm supposed to remind you all that we're recording. So this is the level two research um, support group, and this is really about mid-career researchers just kind of connecting and talking about issues. And then if I don't have anybody who's contacted me in advance where they want to talk about a particular topic, then I will often have something prepared like today. that's just a refresher on something that we've all probably had some deep dives in, but maybe haven't seen for a while. So what I'm presenting today is a slideshow that is from a lecture that I do for the Texas A&M nursing students, and this is for their um, master's level nurses that are kind of doing a research class, but they're a little bit further along in their training. And so this is just kind of their their quick refresher for finals and just kind of getting ready for everything. So, so that's what this is from, and I am going to share my screen. OK, and then you should be able to see randomized control trials, a quick evaluation cheat sheet. Can you see that? Oh, I, I can't see you, unfortunately, on Teams, so. Yes, we can hear. I can see it. OK, perfect. Um, so I always tell the students I'm a big acronym person, and so um, people give me various vaccines. Understand was what I always tell them to think about when they're evaluating a randomized control trial. Um, the reason this might be helpful for faculty is to A, just see how a different faculty member would present this um, to master's prepared students. Um, you could also probably do this with DNP and PhD students if they're fairly entry level. Um, this is obviously from when I was in my postdoctoral program, so it doesn't have Samuel Merritt. I will update that. And so again, this is, you know, I'm going to keep repeating. People give me various vaccines understand because I think it's a helpful mnemonic to have as you kind of go through a mental checklist of what to look at. But just a reminder is that randomized control trials or controlled trials, depends on who says it, um, are just simply comparisons. And they can be between a new treatment versus usual care. For example, you skin your knee, so you can do antibiotic ointment and a band-aid versus just a band-aid. Or between two or more treatments, which could be antibiotic ointment and band-aid versus, um, you know, hydrogen peroxide. And in this circumstance, a band-aid would just be usual care, so that's kind of a given. Um, or between a new treatment and no treatment, or a placebo, which is also known as a control, which is where we get the word randomized control from. Um, so that would be like antibiotic ointment and a Band-Aid versus nothing, uh, which is no treatment, or Vaseline, which uh, I wouldn't recommend, which is why it would be the experimental um, placebo or control. So the P for the people, give me various vaccine, understand, um, is really about the purpose. It's important to understand in a randomized control trial, why did they do this? And when you're reading the write-up of the actual published manuscript, it should be stated in the purpose section of the study, or at the very least, it's often the last sentence of the introduction and background. Um, you may have heard in my um, table of evidence presentation, if you have a hard time finding the purpose, there's a reason. And this can happen fairly frequently with randomized control trials because these are high stakes studies that are quite expensive. So if the purpose is clearly stated, it generally means um, that they set out to do a certain thing, they accomplished it, and now they're presenting the results. But if the purpose is hard to find or it's kind of a little wishy-washy, then what happened most likely is that they set off on one specific purpose and throughout the study either something happened with their sampling methods that made them you know not really be able to find anything publishable or significant um, or some major secular event happened throughout the randomized control trial like there was a pandemic some big event happened and so you may see a disconnect between the purpose and what you're actually reading in terms of methods and, and basically the rest of the study. So you want to ask yourself, did the results line up with what they said they were trying to do? Because if they it, if they did, then great, read on. Um, but if they didn't, I would discard it. And the reason that I say this is because if you're like me, I have to invest a lot of mental energy putting myself into an RCT paper to really understand what were they trying to do and how did they accomplish it. They're usually fairly intense reads. And I'm not going to invest that energy in it if I already know that it's it's not what I'm looking for or they weren't really doing responsible science. There are times that I will do it 
and that's usually when I'm working with a population that's very unusual or is just underrepresented in the scientific literature. And then even if they didn't actually stick to the purpose of their study, I just kind of generally want to know what happened. What are they going to say occurred with this group, especially if I'm launching into a study and I want to know what's it like working with that group? Um, so again, if not, why? because they probably had to pivot mid study to find publishable data because this is a publish or perish space and randomized control trials are very expensive and usually you have pilot data that supports these things. These are the big R01 grants often from NIH. They can be like a million dollars or more. Um, so you got to find something, some sort of output. And um, occasionally I've seen things like, well, our, our walking intervention for diabetes among older Latina women totally failed. But what came out of it was, you know, this novel relationship building where they did peer to peer support, something like that, right? So you may still be able to find some usable data. But basically, if you can't find a clearly stated purpose, it's a poorly written article and it should be discarded. People give me various vaccines, understand? So the give is for the groups. And this is really important because you could teach a whole class on sampling. But basically, how are these groups divided and treated? So the whole purpose of an RCT is to divide people into groups and actually look at the, the comparison between this group versus this group or this group versus the many other groups that we've got. So you want to know, are you comparing apples to oranges here, right? Is there something substantively different between this group and this group that make the results, you know, really not um, statistically significant or clinically significant and they appear that way just because of the actual combination of groups that you're talking. So let's say we are talking about a transportation intervention for um, men living with AIDS um, or men living with HIV, right? So men living with HIV in these two groups, we're, we're trying to decide um, who benefits from this transportation? Well, if one of these groups comes from like a middle class area that is just like, you know, has lots of access, and this other group comes from an area where there is not a lot of access, there's historical um, divestment in the community, obviously this group is going to benefit more from the transportation intervention. And that's just who that group is. But if you try to make any larger assumptions about whether or not that intervention is appropriate or effective, you're going to kind of fall flat. So you want to ask yourself, how was this randomization done? And it should say it in the article. It should say we used a random number generator or we took the first name, um, the first letter of everybody's name and we randomly assigned that way, right? You also want to look at whether there was any chance for contamination or crosstalk. And this can happen in small areas or close or closed groups. So let's say I'm working at the Ultimed clinics, for example, here in Southern California. A lot of their nursing staff um, will work across the clinic sections. So if I decide that I'm going to be working in East LA and I'm also going to be working in South Orange County, um, even though I think those clinics are pretty far away from each other geographically, it's possible that my nurses who live between those two locations are working at both. And this particular group that is having this fantastic intervention that they're really enjoying might be talked about at my control group um, and it can potentially contaminate. And so it is just it, it's often hard to see in the, the paper itself, but you can find it. Sometimes you'll be able to ask yourself some interesting questions when you look at the sampling. People give me various vaccines understand me as the model. And this is really important because I actually think this is the biggest flaw in randomized control trials as a methodology. Um, RCTs are kind of your classic scientific experimentation going back to the age of enlightenment, basically, when they were saying, wow, look at this versus this one and look at the different conditions. We make a lot of assumptions about why things are the way they are. And all of those things are built on this traditional biomedical model that is um, from Western philosophy and believes certain things about people's intentions and their behaviors. Um, and over the years, we've actually built other conceptual or theoretical models around these shared underlying beliefs in our society that may or may not actually translate across the groups that we're looking at. Um, and so you really want to see in the paper can you identify a conceptual or theoretical model? Because if they're lacking a clear model and it would be something like this RCT was informed by the health belief model. 
which states that if people know better, they do better. And that a lack of following health maintenance or preventive care practices is a lack of knowledge, right? That's why that's happening, right? Um, but if they don't actually state that there's a clear model, you have to wonder about how these researchers designed the study, right? How did they choose the variables that they ended up using in this randomized control trial? And so in this particular model that I have right here, um, this is off to the right, um, genetics exercise diet can be used in a lot of um, chronic illness models, right? So I study diabetes generally when I'm not looking at burnout or I look at the effect of burnout on diabetes. And exercise genetics and diet are pretty much part of every single model that determines whether or not you are going to be at risk for type 2 diabetes, right? But if I'm reading a study and somebody throws in movie preferences, now that may be that researcher's understanding of, of how you potentially could be at risk for diabetes. And it's possible that that person is coming from a place of, well, I used to work at a clinic and I noticed that everyone who stayed in weekly for the movie nights and ate popcorn and enjoyed all the snacks that we brought in, um, that group tended to have more presence uh, um, I'm sorry, more prevalence of type 2 diabetes than the group that during that same rest time would go out for a walk. Now, there's a lot of kind of confounding variables in that model, but in this person's mind, maybe this model that you see on the right is exactly what they're using to drive the decision making for this study design, right? And so if you're not careful about making sure that these underlying assumptions are really well stated there, in the manuscript itself or in the study, it can come across as a failure in construct validity. And we're going to talk a little bit about the types of validity in a minute. Um, but it's just this big way that unconscious bias sneaks into how we select our variables. And in medicine, um, not quite so much in nursing, but in medicine traditionally, there are a lot of, um, you know, residual patriarchal kind of heterogeneous dominant culture beliefs about well-being and health. And when we're working with under-resourced minority or underrepresented populations, um, there may be so much that we don't know. So we just have to be really careful about looking at the model and thinking about whether or not they started off with the right foot forward when they were even designing the study itself. So again, does the measure relate to the underlying theoretical concepts? And um, hold on one second. Okay, I guess we're going to go back to the validity and later on in the show. I added this in um, just for this meeting, so we'll hit that later, but I usually skip this when I'm just doing this um, presentation for students. People give me various vaccines, understand? And this is the variables. And we really want to be able to identify them and understand how they were measured. And this, again, is really basic. I apologize for um, faculty that's on this call. Of course, you know um, the independent variable and the, the dependent variable. But even I myself sometimes have to stop and force myself to find them in the beginning of the paper because ironically, sometimes they can be switched. And, um, you know, again, in post-production, creating the manuscript from all the work that was done, sometimes these things can be moved around when the researchers are really comparing these variables in a post hoc way to find something legitimate to publish. So the independent variable is the cause, right? This stands alone, that's why it's independent, and it isn't changed by any other variable. Whereas the dependent variable is the effect. And so this depends on changes in the independent variable. So in my kind of diabetes research world, um the let's see so let's say that the dependent variable is the um oh, we'll start with independent variable the independent variable in this case is the blood sugar your a1c which can go up and down and is doing that on its own and the dependent variable might be um retinopathy risk for retinopathy or um risk for foot ulcers right because that is dependent on what your blood sugar is doing at the time um, and these variables have one of four different levels of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. Um, and, you know, again, I've had, I have this mapped out right there. I don't know that I definitely need to go into this in depth because I know this is review for everyone. Um, but ratio really is just the difference between measurements. Um, and there is a true zero, which is important to know. Um, interval data, which measures between two different marks on your measure. Um, but there's no true zero. Right. Um, and that's important to know. We use that a lot in like Likert scales, for example. 
Um, ordinal data, which is also called categorical, um, but is related to ranking. So it's like ranked categories um, from like first to second to third, that sort of thing. And then just categorical, where there is no ordering, zero doesn't mean anything, there's no direction. Um, so yeah, so that last categorical I also have here is nominal. Not to be confusing, I know it's a little bit confusing because the labels get moved around a little bit because as we kind of mentioned before we started this presentation, all of this is made up. It is a, a living, breathing science that we continue to adapt and advance. Um, and you're going to see that in the next two slides. So people give me various vaccines, understand? So the second V is validity. And this is about, is the study logically or factually sound? And obviously you want that to be true. Otherwise you don't want to waste your time reading it and you certainly don't want to use it to build your own assumptions for your projects. Um, what you see here is kind of the clinicians, the clinician researchers version of validity. There's kind of a more in-depth scientific validity that I'm going to talk about on the next slide. Um, but this is generally what we like to see in manuscripts when we're reviewing for our peers or we're trying to write something up for ourselves or, or plan to write something. Um, statistical validity is the extent to which differences in the outcome are the results of differences in performance rather than chance, right? So this is also um, related to the p-value, right? We generally want to believe that what we're observing is not just randomly occurring, but is actually a direct result of whatever it is we're trying to accomplish. Internal validity is the extent to which the intervention can reliably have affected the change. There may be a change in our population, but how do we know that it's based on our actual intervention? Again, really important during the pandemic. Um, construct validity. Again, this kind of goes back to what we just talked about in terms of conceptual theoretical foundation. Um, and this relates to the association between the concept that you're investigating and the actual measures that are used to test it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then external validity. And this is the thing that everybody makes a huge deal about in clinical studies. And this is basically the extent to which it can be applied to other populations. So they will say, is it generalizable? Um, I think that we put too much energy into whether things are generalizable because I think that humans in general are, um, you know, we're a heterogeneous group. There's a lot of differences within and between us. And I think that you can do very legitimate science in small distinct populations that could really benefit from your focus. But that's just my own take on that. Um, and then because this is more of an advanced group, I just wanted to remind us of the kind of overarching scientific validity that we generally talk about when we're talking from a, a capital S science perspective and not just within clinical spaces. Um, so again, validity just tells you how accurately a method is measuring something, what you want it to measure. Um, and yeah, what it claims to measure and how closely this corresponds to real world values. Um, and that's probably the most important takeaway from this to just remind ourselves all the time that we can never really understand capital T truth with the studies that we do. We're at best getting our impression to the to the you know to the best of our abilities. We're trying to understand smaller truths that make up the patterns and, and observations that we are able to have in the plane of existence that we're in. Right, so you can get into these much larger philosophical discussions with your students because, um, you know, the what is truth is actually kind of a big question in this space. But again, construct validity, we talked about this. Does the test measure what it's supposed to measure? And so the idea here is that we can't measure concepts directly, but we can observe them based on indicators that are associated with them. So in my case, I care about like blood sugar. Um, I'm sorry, I care about like the effect of depression or mental health on blood sugar. Um, and I can't necessarily just observe depression, but I can measure it based on things I know about it, right? So the example here is there's no objective observable entity called depression um, that we can measure, but based on you know psychological research and theory, we can measure depression based on a collection of symptoms and indicators that reflect you know, the concept of depression. Um, similarly, content validity, we wanna know, is the test fully representative of what it's supposed to measure, right? Um, because 
there may be aspects of that construct like depression that are really critical to depression. Um, but if we're not measuring that aspect of it, then we're kind of leaving something important on the table. So an example of this is a math teacher develops an end of semester algebra test for the class and the test should cover every form of algebra that was taught in the class. If a bunch of types of algebra are left out, then the results of whether or not the students understood the subject are a little shaky, right? Similarly, if the teacher questions things that are that aren't related to algebra on the test, I mean, then you're not really measuring algebra knowledge. And so we actually see this fairly frequently in measures of um, physical activity among ethnic minority groups where they're being asked how much um, they engage in physical activity, but then sometimes the questions on the measure ask them about exercises that they could just not never afford or culturally not um, a tradition with that group or aren't appropriate for like the weather where they live. Um, and you could actually show up on those tests that, wow, it looks like you're really not very physically active, um, but it's because we only asked you about golf or something, right? There's face validity. Um, this is like superficial validity. It's like, does the test seem to be appropriate for the aims, right? Um, it's very surface level. It's kind of similar to content validity, but it's very informal and kind of subjective. And for a lot of researchers, you'll see this in the manuscript at, you know, face validity appears reasonable for this population. What you can also do when you're establishing face validity is you're trying to look at Bayesian priors, which is what other people used in this similar circumstance. Therefore, it's probably fine, right? So an example here is you create a survey to measure um, the regularity of people's dietary habits. You review the survey items, you ask questions about every meal of the day and snacks that they eat between for every day of the week. So on the surface, it seems like a pretty good representation of what you want to test. So that's fine, good face validity, right? Um, in terms of criterion validity, do the results correspond to a different test of the same thing? And that's kind of interesting because um, those of you who study depression, there's a variety of depression scales that we can use, but again, they study different aspects of it. So an example here would be that a university professor creates a new test to measure the applicant's uh, English writing ability. Um, and so to see how well the test does measure what she wants it to measure, she finds an existing test that's considered a valid measure and then compares the results. And so if the outcomes are pretty similar, then the test has high criterion validity. And um, if you're a researcher who's really into methodology, you may be validating measures, especially if you're working in a, a population that hasn't traditionally been studied. Often you will go through this process of evaluating the criterion validity before you use the tool in this new group, right? Because you don't want to ask people about golf if they live in Alaska and they're a low income population, like that's probably not the right thing to do. And we're on the final one, understand, right? People give me various vaccines, understand? And this is about the usefulness um, because it's a reminder to not torture yourself with manuscripts that don't necessarily move your particular research forward. So you really wanna ask yourself, how does this impact care delivery? Especially if you're at a Samuel Merritt, which really focuses a lot on quality and performance improvement initiatives. Right, so evidence-based practice in nursing provides nurses with scientific research to make these well-founded decisions and stay updated about new medical protocols for patient care. So ask yourself, like, is this study going to help me? <laughs> right, if this study doesn't add anything to what I can actually do on the floor with my students, then maybe this isn't a good investment of my time, even if it's a good study in and of itself. Right, you may not want to read 18 pages of a dense RCT, for a population that doesn't match where you're going to go. And so you might want to just ask yourself, let me think of a quick clinical scenario and think about whether or not exposing my students to this particular manuscript would be helpful to them in any way, because sometimes it's not. And so again, your cheat sheet is people give me various vaccines understand, but the idea is you want to look at the purpose, the groups, the model or, you know, conceptual theoretical model, the variables, the validity, and the usefulness. And if all of those things are in alignment, then it's probably a good investment of time, which I think is really important because a lot of us don't have that much time, but at the same time, we really want to stay current with our practice. So I am going to stop sharing.
And I know that was a lot to go through. It is recorded, um, but I just wanted to see, is that generally how you would present to students here? Is that the kind of content that you give them? Um, or was any of this just kind of a, oh, I hadn't thought about that in a while? Um, well, I know for me, I definitely cover this stuff and I talk it. Like oh no, I think you're muted. I'm, I'm sorry, I thought I undid my mute, but I didn't, I must have hit it. Anyway, it, I mean, a lot of it is basically very similar. I love your, your, um, your, um, what a, you know what I'm, you know what oh, I mean? Acronym? acronym, I'm like analogram or whatever. I'm like, no, that's not the word. Um, anyway, I love, I love that, but yeah. And I think it helps break it down. I think students really, believe it or not, the HESI exam asks a lot of this stuff. Now, I don't think any of this stuff is ever gonna be on the boards, on yeah. the nursing boards, but when they take that research HESI, it's asking stuff about internal validity, external validity, and I try to explain it, and and I just, I think I do a good job of it, but I give them a lot of supplemental material. Um, but I think it's really helpful. I mean, I think for Laura, it, you know, I don't know how you feel if that's some, if this is something like, let's say you're looking at an article and you wanna help support something like with evidence-based practice and you're looking at stuff and you're trying to talk to students about it being a good study, like, you know, it's like the practical information. Mm. Does that? I guess it's not it, what, it's not so much the the research part that's helpful, it's just seeing your presentation and knowing that you've done this a, a, a bunch of times. And it, it's, it's a, I like the, I like the way you did that acronym, like you said, and then broke it down. Um, and now you're, and we have the question and discussion session now, which makes it interactive. So that's all, that's all fun. Um, yeah, I, I, it was a good review and yeah, I had forgotten about all those different um, <laughs> types of validities and all those because um, I don't, I'm, you know, I'm masters, I'm not a DMP, um, I'm mass, um, nurse practitioner, but, and I, so my, I didn't do education either, which maybe they had a little more research in that, I'm not sure, but in our NP, I had one research class and so I want to do the research, I just, um, yeah, I don't know where, where to start, so it's still kind of all beyond me. I understand the importance of it and everything that you talked about there, finding the purpose. So, um, and you know, seeing what the groups are. Yeah, I'm actually doing a lot of just research right now on all the COVID vaccines and the research of those and trying to have that discussion with patients, you know, as a provider and then also as a nurse, you know, they come in and ask me all the time. So I'm always like, just, you know, look at the studies and all the different medicines and stuff available. It's so frustrating. So I'm always like really with learning myself how to first look at these research articles with a, a scientific mind, you know, and see if it's a good study or not. And you'd, it's surprising. <laughs> There's a lot that aren't right now. There's um, a lot that aren't. Absolutely. And I can kind of now pick those out like, oh, look, this was a random, like I just read Pfizer's was a randomized control. And, and then they, they stopped um, having a control group and then gave it to the controls. And I'm like, how is this even like, this is no longer a good study. Yeah. And you just start giving, you know, the control group. There's no control group now. Do you? Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Although, you know, IRB. Um, so I'm sure the reason I am not familiar with the one you're talking about, but there there are some provisions within IRB where once there is a clear establishment of uh, improvement for one group, it's unethical uh -huh. to give it to the other group. OK, so maybe that's why seeing like those little things. I need that refresher. Yeah. yeah. So maybe that's what happened. I'm not sure. But the length of it was only six ethics months. in your. Oh, I'm sorry. You yes. put ethics in your. Um, in there, because I was going to talk to you about some things that I explained to the students as far as with RCTs. I and, should. Absolutely. I, you know, yeah. this I this um, slideshow goes so quickly yeah. that you really have to have spent a day on each one of these acronym words to uh -huh. really uh -huh. get them to understand what, how do you do sampling? What right. does that right. even mean? So that um, at Texas A&M, they get this like week eight or nine, and they get this before they get assigned a, a pretty crummy RCT 
and then they write a paper where they pull apart according to the acronym. Did you find the purpose and it was it good? Was it not? What do you have to say about it? And then at the end I'm gonna of over to my phone because I have to take my son to football. So I'll still be listening. Well, this is recorded. So drive okay. safe. Okay, so I might just let you guys go. This was I mean, yeah. No problem. I have to get him off to football. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally get it. Yeah. <laughs> I might still um, just go on and listen because I like the chat. Yeah, I like the I like what you're you like. talking about. And um and so they get this and they get the crummy article and they get like a week to be able to go through it and write up kind of how they would use this acronym and then at the end of it, would you recommend this article to anybody? Um, and would you use this to to affect your practice? And sometimes you would like if you're working with a like Iranian immigrants from like, you know, the last 10 years, like there's like three articles out there. So you probably still are going to use it because there's so, you know, this paucity of literature. you got to use anything you can, but you kind of keep an eye to the fact that I, I know that there are limitations, though, you know, yeah. um, the the ethics. Because I got one, oh, then one of the things that I, because one of the things that I talk to my students about, and I give, I loved your movie preferences example, because I give really ridiculous examples to the <laughs> students, like, um, and, and remember to, I actually, I have to tell you something, because when I started at UCLA, I'm from the East Coast. I had never been, I had a lifelong dream of living in LA. Personally, I was just hoping I would get noticed in the grocery store and I wouldn't have to finish my PhD. And I would yes. just get I would just get found and and you know, and and there was that. I didn't have to do a nursing degree. So but I also used to drive on the freeways and say, who the heck designed these freeways? And I just I was like, I'm not doing my dissertation on a nursing issue. I'm doing my dissertation on traffic flow on yeah. California freeways. And so I just found something about where they actually did research to show that when people merge, if a lane is going to end, and I was like, oh my gosh, I could have done that as my dissertation. <laughs> but know, but ethically, but that's I the tell thing students. Oh, I'm sorry. They, oh no, go ahead. Just, I, but I just want to jump off that. That's what I think we forget to tell students. We you, we say it's like a PhD or it's a DNP. For the PhD especially, we act like, well, I am doing a PhD in nursing. But the nursing part is quiet because it's just science. We're all doing the same right. PhD in science, you know? And like my topic happens to be about, you know, people in health and that sort of thing. But like you could easily be studying traffic, right? <laughs> There's skills. Yeah, but so I tell the students, I said, okay, there everybody thinks you know this is what students come into my class with the only good study is a randomized control trial oh yeah no okay that's it everything should be a randomized control trial and i said but some things don't lend themselves to randomized control trials so the example is how do you think the airlines would feel let's say we want to study coach versus first class and the effect on potentially developing DVTs, right? Yeah. I said, do you think the airlines are going to give in to us randomizing patient, you know, yeah. people to first class versus coach? Do you think those frequent flyers who were, are expecting they're getting upgraded to first class are going to give in to going into coach? No. So some things just don't, I have to give like a practical example for why yeah. things just don't work. And um, and when you said the ethics and I, you know, students also don't know this it is and I only remember this was because I did before I moved to L.A. I was um, the research coordinator for some of the phase. Three drug trials for um, Pulmazine for cystic fibrosis. And um, and basically what I learned was I learned a lot about you know, the FDA and drug trials and stuff. And once the drug is showing that it's effective, it's unethical to withhold it yep. from the control group. And, you know, and then that goes back to the whole ethics discussion about, you know, what were some of our past issues in ethics and 
those things. Yeah, it's definitely like a least harms trade off. It's it mm -hmm. doesn't it doesn't benefit the science, but it certainly benefits our performance of it as you know humane people. Right. Um, I was going to tell you, so I, you know, I have my own LinkedIn thing like we all do, and I will just write um, little pieces for my LinkedIn page that are just kind of musings or short articles. They're not peer reviewed, um, but I do have one that is a, is it a what, when question or a how, why question? I think that's the okay. title. And it really talks about why do you use qualitative versus quantitative and when should you with very practical responses? because a lot of times people are hesitant to deal with qualitative they feel like they don't know it or they're just not good at it and it's not cut and dry um but mm -hmm. it's such valuable information yeah. um and um and also you know it's hard to to do it well it takes a lot of extra training and so people don't like to hear that there's things you can't just learn and just do um yeah. so anyway yeah. no and well i i commend anybody um i'm office mates with bill randall and he just finished his phd at uc davis and did qualitative research and i've had him do my guest lecture for qualitative research because i'm i'm a numbers person and you know i did i i give the example i did do some open-ended questions but my analysis of them were not very rigorous so i didn't even publish that information because it wasn't you know i didn't do it in a in a true qualitative analysis fashion and so you know it's it's nice being able you mentioned that about having expertise here and there yeah and you I don't like have that. everything, right? Well, yeah. another thing that you might like that I can maybe share with you is that um, I have a lot of students that I mentor that are medical students, and by and large, they are numbers people. Um, and so I actually do a word cloud analysis with them, which is really content analysis. It's like the most quant of the qualitative. Um, do you ever do word clouds with your students? Mm -mm. I could I could definitely show you or I can I can create something for one of these sessions um, because it's a quick and easy way to have the content just kind of jump off the page at you. Oh, it's like yeah. based on how often the words are repeated, you immediately see the key stakeholders and the key issues. OK, and so um, so yeah, no, I, it's it's weird that there's such a high bar for it. Like at UCLA, when I went to do a qualitative dissertation, you have an entire extra year you have to stay to do the courses. Um, and so my PhD actually took five years instead of four years um, to do the qualitative series, which again, I'm, I'm grateful that I got the training, but that's a lot to ask of people. Yeah, when, so when, when were you there? Uh, so I finished in 2019 um, and I oh. started in 2014. Um, okay. And I did my master's at Drew, which was just kind of a straight like clinical nurse leadership where we got a little bit of of uh, I think we had one research class. Um, okay. So that's very similar, I think, to what our FNPs would get or, our, and, you know, the DNPs get more. But yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I just I mean, I was there. I I officially and that's what I put it in the email. I officially finished in 2002. Now I took eight years. But during the course of that time, I learned a lot about myself and, yeah. you know, I learned a lot about myself and um, and. I mean, it, it took me a while. There were many times that I almost quit and, you know, and I would. Have to sit down with faculty and they would have to like reel me in and, you know, tell me it's OK, it's OK. <laughs> um, because it was hard. I was single and living alone and financially LA is expensive. And oh, yeah. so there was a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, and I think the whole PhD system is really designed to grind you down to the the smallest particles of dust and your ego is just destroyed so that you can be a feedback taking machine. Like nobody can break me down at this point. Like I've kind of been through that and it, the sad part is like we often say, you know, if you're not suicidal or constantly thinking about quitting, you're probably not doing the PhD right, right? Like there's so much personal growth that happens there. 
Um, but I wish we could do it in a way that was kinder to each other. Um, yeah, the, you, you talked about murals and it made me think of, um, you know, cause I had some friends and they were, none of them were in the PhD program. I had just met a lot of people in LA through, through my church. And we one time had, it's called the artist way. It's very old, mm -hmm. the book, the artist way. And so one day we were doing, um, we were making our posters and we were ripping out all the stuff. And it was during a very difficult time of, of my PhD. And I, um, I went ahead and there was like things like I was, there, I was on a bridge, mm -hmm. there was fire. <laughs> and, and the following year, I think that was when I finally like secured all the stuff. I did my, um, I did all my data collection through the pulmonary clinic at Children's Hospital LA. And I finally secured everything. I was like, oh, this is, everything was going so much better. And then the following year, because we would do it once a year and we would like compare our posters. And the next thing was like, it was like all this like pastel and it was soothing. <laughs> it was very interesting to see it. So it is, a, it's a challenge, but um, you know, it's so hard because the students need this content. And I think it is so difficult. I mean, for to get a grasp on it. And I wish there was like, I mean, yeah, it's, and I think part of it is just, they're not listening to my lectures. You know, <laughs> I, I probably have, to, I've got to figure out a better way of making them accountable for my lectures because I teach the stuff, I teach it. I, yeah. again, I think there is, um, there's just resistance built up about science, big science and research. And it's, if you have even a hint of imposter syndrome, this stuff really sets it off because it immediately sounds like it's too hard for the average person. And I, you know, I would love to work with you because I think if they're smart enough to, and driven enough, frankly, to get into the program, then they're capable of it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, a, it's a, a process of like, how do we engage them and convince them that this is for them? Yeah. You know? yeah. So. so, and it's just the undergraduate, you know, this is just the ABSN yeah. students. Yeah. Um, I, I think I taught a long time ago. I taught 601 with Dr. McIntyre a long time ago um, when I first started here. But, but, you know, I did send you the email. Um, I, you know, I don't know. Um, you're still down in LA. So, and I don't know if you want to stop recording um, sure. Know. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to stop and then thanks everybody for for showing up and we'll connect next week. All right.